Welcome to the first video of our grade 12 pre-calculus course. Uh, this is to go with chapter one of our textbook and in fact um, chapter one here are all the outcomes and you can take a look at that and maybe read through that and may say nod your head a few times and say yeah I'm learning that. Um, this will actually be a bit of a review before we get started on the first part of chapter one so that's why here it says review. Uh, so first of all just to go over what is a domain and what is range. So uh, the domain, I guess the simplest way we could say it, this would be uh, the set of all possible x values. Now of course we don't always say x values. We can label the the x-axis, the horizontal axis in, with different letters. So another way we could uh, define this is the independent variable. I'll just go VAR short for variable. Um, so this would be what we're allowed to plug into the function. Okay. So if I would say, uh, you know, here is some function here, and it could be a variety of things. It could be the function could be doing things like add 2 to whatever number goes into it. So the number that goes into the function we call that x and then what comes out then we could call that y. So in this case the domain would be what's allowed to go into the function. The range would be very similar. It'd be uh, the set of all possible y values. Instead of independent now it would be the dependent variable. The one that comes out of the function. <clears throat> And uh, quite often, I'll just add a little bit here, uh, we can have an ordered pair. So an ordered pair is the x and the y that go together, and when we write an ordered pair, we make sure we put the brackets around it. Okay, so let's take a look at a, a few functions, and then we're going to define the domain and the range using both set notation and interval notation. I'm pretty sure that you've seen some of these before, uh, but be depending on where you took math and things like that, we might want to change them. Uh, I'm going to make one change to this first graph. Instead of having it end at negative 6, I'm going to have an open circle uh, uh, and make it go to negative 7. Oh, I had a little trouble making that stay. Let's try that again. Uh, to negative 7. So what that means is that this uh, line goes up to but doesn't touch negative 7. So what would the domain be? Now you might just say, oh it goes from negative 7 and I'm going to sort of build it here. So I'll start from the inside. It goes from negative 7 up to positive 6 right? and uh, it doesn't touch negative 7 so x would have to be uh, greater than negative 7, but x would also be less than or equal to 6. So you notice how we set this up. This is the smaller value, this is the larger value, and when x is, includes everything else in between. Now, uh, for some of us, that'd be enough of a way to, to, to uh, define this. But in set notation, you can sort of think of it as a very uh, prescribed grammar of math. So just like in English, you've got to be careful about your quotation marks and your commas and things like that. So when you do set notation, you should actually start off with a, a curly brace, uh, which I'm not great at writing, but something like that. And then whichever variable we're talking about, so x, and then we have a vertical line, and that means such that. And then you have your uh, you know, negative 7 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 6, or you might have uh, x cannot be something. You have some kind of argument there. And then you have to say uh, what set of values you're talking about. x in this case, and in a lot of our course, x is a member of the real numbers. So this looks like a funny looking e kind of. Oh, let me try that one more time. Shall I erase it? You know what, I'll zoom in a bit and try it again here. Uh, X can, and it's sort of an E thing, that means it's a part of the set of real values. And that looks something like this, and then we need that curly brace. Maybe I should get that one. Okay, so, and remember uh, this vertical line here, when we read that, that would be in English we'd say such that. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the interval notation. So it's going to mean the same thing, but it's just another way of writing it. So the interval notation would we'd say, okay, I want to go from negative seven up to positive six, and we in um, 
in our set notation, it's whether or not we had that line underneath to say whether it touched the negative 7 or not. So the way we do that in interval notation is that we're going to be using a, an open bracket here and a closed bracket on this side. Okay, so this here is called an open bracket. That means that uh, negative 7 is not touched. So that's what it means by having this circle here. So it goes up to but doesn't touch negative 7. And then this one here is what we call, here's a closed bracket. Alright, now the for the range, so now what be all the possible y values? So the smallest the y is is negative 4, and it includes everything up to including positive 4. So quite similarly here, so we're going to start with this curly braces. We'll say y such that negative 4 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 4, where y is a member of all the real numbers. And in set notation, quite simply, negative 4, comma 4. Uh, and because it touches both the negative 4, because it's a, a solid, it's a closed circle, if it's a closed circle, we'll do a closed brackets for both of them. Okay, so let's take a look at our next one here. Uh, this is going to be one that you're going to see more in the future. It's a 1 over x. So uh, you'll remember here that we can't plug in an x value that is 0. So our domain will include all real values except for 0 because we don't want to divide by 0 then we get an error. And if you look at the graph, we, it's, it's not written in but there is a, an asymptote. There is a horizontal asymptote so usually we draw that with a dashed line and there's a vertical asymptote and usually we draw that with a dashed line. So that will show you that these lines are approaching but never touching the asymptotes, the dashed lines that are wrote in red. So let's first of all put the domain and we'll say, well, curly brace x such that. And now in our argument, instead of a, instead of a less than, instead of an inequality, we're going we're gonna to say, well, x cannot be equal to 0. Uh, otherwise, x can be anything that's a real number. And for our range, it's going to look exactly the same. So I'll write the same thing. But now I'll just replace my x's with y's. And now for my interval notation. Um, it's a little bit different now. Um, we get to use the infinity sign. And so here we can say this can go from negative infinity all the way up to zero. It doesn't touch zero, so I need my open bracket. And we never use a closed bracket for infinity. And I think it's a bit of a philosophical position here. We can say that infinity isn't a number. Infinity is a process of getting larger all the time. And we can't put a closed bracket over that process because that would sort of limit it. At least that's the way I look at it. So it's uh, now I've covered this left half of the, the negative line going off to negative infinity. and But now I also have to put the other part, which is... 0 to positive infinity. I can put a positive or I can leave it blank, it doesn't matter here, and again it looks like this. And now I want to show that it's going to be the union of those sets. So I'll, I'll put a u for union. Uh, the other one is this one which means intersection. Which we will actually not be using, I don't think, ever in this course uh, necessarily. So it's usually that means this union. So all of these, as well as all of those. Okay. So the answer can be this or that. Now for the range, it looks exactly the same. So um, I'll just copy out my work. All right. Looking at our next example. So this is a very familiar uh, one from grade 11. Here's uh, x squared plus 1. So for our domain, uh, even though it might look like this arrow is not going to go off forever to the right, we can put any value of x in there. So x can be all real values. So it's pretty straightforward. We'll say x such that x is a part of all the real numbers. Okay, and uh, the range, however, has to be, it touches 1, and then it's greater than 1. So we'll say y such that uh, y is greater than or equal to 1, where y is a real number. So using interval notation, 
uh, all real numbers, kind of an easy one, go from negative infinity up to positive infinity and put those open brackets around it um, for y is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, it's a little bit easier, we can say 1 up to positive infinity. Uh, it touches 1, so I can go like this and like that. Okay, so we're good to go. Um, here, this next one, it's just a straight straight linear line, a linear uh, function. Y is, or f of x is equal to 3x, and so we can have any x value. So again, we're going to have x such that x is all real numbers. And the range, same thing, but now we'll say it in, with y. And here we can have anything. So we'll say from negative infinity up to positive infinity. And here, same thing. Okay, going on to our, our next page. Here's some uh, graphs that some of them you're familiar with already, the, the linear function. Uh, so this is a basic function. Uh, later on, I'll also be using the term uh, parent. We could also use the word parent function here. Uh, and their graph, so this is a straight line. Here's a quadratic that you're familiar with before. And we just did a variation of that one, right? We did y is equal to x, player, x squared plus 1. Here's one that we saw a minute ago, is this 1 over x. Uh, here is y is equal to the square root of x. Now it's interesting to see that, that you cannot have a, a negative value, right? So you, we can't do the square root of a negative value. So this is why the line starts at 0 and then goes off to the right from that. Uh, here is the absolute value. Okay, so absolute value, whatever number you plug in, in inside of these vertical lines, the, these vertical bars we call the uh, absolute value symbols. So if I put, say, a negative 3 inside of there, it comes out as a 3. If I put a 3 inside of there, it comes out as a 3. So it's, uh, it's like we took the y is equal to x, and we reflected over this x-axis, we reflected as if it was a mirror and made it positive. So if we took this point and put it up here and this point and put it up there. So these negative values became positive values. Here, I'll erase that just so I don't confuse anybody. Okay, uh, the cubic function, kind of a neat looking one, uh, which is actually looks a lot like one below it, which is tan, which we'll take a look at in a second. Uh, here is our y equals the sine of x and the cos of x. Uh, if you took some some grade 11 physics, you'll be familiar with the, the basic waves, and we'll be talking about sine and cos. Uh, I'll mention right now that both sine and cos can be considered sinusoidal functions. You might think by looking at this word that it would only be sine is a sinusoidal function, but both sine and cos are sinusoidal functions. They're very similar, aren't they? They're just the, the where they start. Sine starts from the origin, goes up. Cos starts from a maximum, then comes down. So it's, if really you can just shift one, you can make the other one. Um, this this graph for, for tan of x that you had, it almost looks like it's a straight line, but if you zoom in a bit more, you get something a bit more f similar, and I, I sketched it off to the right here. So it has sort of this, uh, what we call an inflection point, where it changes directions. And then we've got these uh, vertical asymptotes that come along. We'll be studying that also quite a bit later in our course. But just to get you familiar with a, a few of the basic functions and what they look like. Okay, so we have many strategies to graph functions and relations. So uh, I guess the simplest one would be a table of values, which we've been doing for, for quite some time. Uh, another one would be to start with a parent function. Start with a parent function. and apply something we call transformations. Oops, try it again. Transformations. So uh, we'll see what that means just a little bit below. Uh, a couple other ones is we could draw x-intercepts. 
Okay, so what's an x-intercept? So if we have a graph and uh, it uh, crosses uh, at some spot, this is where the x-intercept would be, right there. Right, that would be our x-intercept, where it crosses the x-axis. So how do you find that out? It crosses the x-axis when y is equal to 0. Okay, so the process really is um, find x when y is equal to 0. Um, the, our last one is we can find the y-intercept. And really that is uh, find the y-value when x is equal to 0. All right, so let's let's try this. This is what we're going to finish off with. We're going to graph y is equal to x squared. Uh, y is equal to x squared plus 2. Maybe that'll be our, our green work there. And then we'll do uh, y is equal to x minus 5 all squared. So starting with our uh, y is equal to x squared, um, if I plug a, a 0 in for x, then 0 squared is 0. If I plug in a negative 1, I'll get 1. And negative 2, I get positive 4, and then 1 we get 1, and 2 we get 4. So if over here, if I was to graph those points, and I'll just show my scale uh, at least once. Okay, so when you're making these graphs, at some point along the way, you should, uh, by labeling at least one spot on the x and your y, you should be able to demonstrate what the scale is. So I'm just doing a 1 for 1 scale. So my graph 0, 0. Uh, 1 comma 1, negative 1 comma 1, 2 comma 1, 2, 3, 4. Let me see if I can get 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. No, I can get a 9 in here. There we go. And now the tough part is trying to draw this and still kind of give it a curvy look here. To try again here, just keep going there, something like that. So it's my blue. Make sure you put arrows at the end, and it should clearly touch that spot. So we'll just work it in a little bit there. There's my first one, and so this is my y is equal to x squared. All right, x squared. Now, there our next one, the y is equal to x squared plus 2. Uh, let's see what happens when we do this. If we plug in, if we do the same values for x, what happens to our y values? So for our first one, if I plug in a, a 0 for x, 0 squared is 0 plus 2, so I get a 2. Uh, if I plug in a 1 here, 1 squared is 1, plus 2 is 3. If I plug a 2, 2 squared is 4, plus 2 is 6. And so uh, with my negative 1, I get a 3 again, and with a, I, I think I do, and with the negative 2, I get a 6. Okay. Um, so if I graph this over here, I'm going to have my x values are going to be the same. My x values are going to be the same. Notice this negative 2 and the negative 2. But what happened to my y values over here? On each case, they're too higher, aren't they? So here we get a 1 turns into a 3, a 0 turns into a 2, a 1, a 3, and a 4, and a 6. So you may have even noticed that as I was completing my table of values. So what does that look like? Okay, so we'll start off with our 0, comma 2. Uh, a 0, comma 2 or goes right over there. Our second spot was uh, 1, comma 3. So 1, comma 1, 2, 3. So you'll see where this plus 2 situation, that plus 2, uh, comes, it looks like this, doesn't it? Each, pl each point that we drew before is going to be up 2 higher. Uh, this one that was at 9 it would go up 2 higher, which I guess is just barely off of our graph. So you can see that, that, that up 2 nature uh, of that transformation. So I'll try to draw my nice curve here. Oh, it's hard to do a nice curve. Something like this, okay, and that will be our y is equal to x squared plus 2. Okay, so you can see, uh, make sure I put my arrows at the end, you can see when we're talking about basic strategies, we're doing the table of values, but we're also kind of doing this start with a parent function and apply transformations. We're just in the beginning of this unit, and we're seeing right away, hey, if I add this plus 2 to it, to this piece right here, well, what happens? It moves up 2, 
right? And we can we, we can take that piece and move it up to. Uh, let me just try something really crazy here. Sometimes I can do this if I take. Oh, maybe it won't work. Oh, okay, all right. Sometimes you can just actually grab that thing in in this program and move it up. Let's do our last one here. Uh, here we're putting a minus five and we're putting it inside. Okay, so. I'm actually going to, instead of using negative 2 and up to positive 2, just because I've been thinking about what this is going to look like afterwards, I'm going to start with a 5 here, and, and I think you'll see why in a minute. So if I plug in a 5 for x, 5 minus 5 is 0, and 0 squared is 0. Okay. If I put a 6 in for x, 6 minus 5 is 1, 1 squared is 1. If I put a 7 in for x, 7 minus 5 is 2, 2 squared is 4. With a 4, I'm going to get a 1, and with a 3, I'm going to get a 7. Okay, so now, comparing with my original ordered pair, so this would be my x and my y, look what happened here. Now my, my y stayed the same, okay, but my x values, I don't want to get it too messy, but my x values... got larger by 5. That's kind of surprising almost, right? Because because here, this minus 5, that one made my x values uh, went up by 5, uh, plus 5 to my x values. So what does what happens in terms of visually when we add 5 to the x values? Okay, so we'll start with this point, the 5 comma 0. So the 5 comma 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 comma 0. And then that is... Um, the vertex, and we're going to follow that same pattern uh, 2 over and 1, 2, 3, 4 up, 2 over and 1, 2, 3, I guess it'd be about there. And my graph looks like this. And I, I really should go up further, but I just don't want to make it too much of a mess of all these overlapping. So you can see this here's my. Uh, there's my plus 5 to my x values, right? So when I say plus 5 to x values, an easier way to say that would be to the right 5. Okay, so this is what we're, what, this is really the basis of our unit here, is learning how to do this well. Start with a parent function and apply transformations. So first of all, we're going to recognize, hey, when you see that pattern, take your basic parent function and go up to. When you see this pattern, Take your parent function and move right five. So that's what we're learning this unit. Uh, something about our mapping, uh, our, our mapping notation. It's just another way of writing stuff. Um, if I have y is equal to x squared, and I'm going to call that my parent function. And let's say if I have another one, y is equal to x squared plus two in this case, I'm going to call that my image. Okay, any point in my original parent function, so I'm just going to say x comma y, and that's going to represent any ordered pair, any x and y value. So for example, 0 comma 0, 1 comma 1, and 2 comma 4. So if I grab any one of those ones, the corresponding point on the image would be, well, the x value stayed the same, and my y value got 2 added to it. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping. So that's where the word mapping comes from. So I, I take this point and I map it onto the image. So the, the point x comma y on my parent function corresponds to x comma y plus 2 on my image function. So this, is, this way of doing this mapping you're going to see is, um, makes things a little bit easier. All right. So for the definitions, I pre-wrote this so you don't have to go through the agony of me of watching me write. Uh, the transfer a transformation is a change made to a function that changes its graph in any combination of the following ways: a shift left or right, a shift up or down, and we call that a translation. So we've seen that today, right? We saw a shift to the right, and we saw a shift up. So we can also move it left, and we can also move it down. You might even be able to guess how to do that. Some other ways of transforming is to stretch or to compress, uh, and also to reflect. Okay, so I think I... let's see if I can do this here. Um, oh, sometimes I can uh, oh, grab this piece here. 
Oh, I think I... Hmm. Bear with me at home. Okay, so I might be able to do a stretch. There we go. I think I can take this piece here, and I can show you what a, a stretch would look like. So that would be a stretch. Okay, that would be a horizontal stretch. Here would be a horizontal compression. Okay, um, this would be a vertical stretch, and this would be a vertical compression. Okay, and last but not least, I wrote in red underneath. This is this would would look like a uh, reflection over the x-axis. Okay, if we were to reflect over the y-axis, then it would end up looking over here. Okay, so those are the last. So the word transformation, the word transformation and the word tra uh, transformation and translation are quite similar. So a translation is a type of transformation. So a transformation can include translations, which are just shifts. This is uh, another, you can just think of these as shifts. Uh, another type of a transformation is a stretch or a compression. Another type of transformation is a reflection. And that's what we're going to be learning. Okay, and uh, I think that's all we have for this uh, initial lesson. So there isn't any textbook work. Uh, that'll be, you'll have to watch next, the next lesson before we start doing some textbook exercises.